people can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. Show me any country and there'll be people in it. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. You know, think on that. Without people, you're nothing. Without people, you're nothing. Stoke the fire. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a kind of landmark episode of the podcast, episode 30 of wow. Stoke the Fire. And because we've hit this mini landmark of sorts, we figured it was time we got on a special guest, um, somebody who's not only a fellow podcaster, but also a fellow Gas Digital Network member. Uh, and he very kindly invited myself and Jesse onto his show before we'd even started ours as a platform to shout about it and and promote it and and that was a really fun chat wasn't it i seem to remember there was a lot of psychedelic discussion and there was laughter just a lot of laughter and a lot of good times so if you haven't already guessed if you haven't already read the description you probably you know saw that and you know who it is anyway but without further ado (laughs) let's bring on our very special guest for episode 30 of the podcast ladies and gentlemen mr rob flynn the general What's up, guys? Yeah, brother. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. Kicking it here in my studio, Tuesday. Dig it. Yeah, Tuesday. gorgeous day outside. Yeah, like 90 same. Degrees, 90 degrees out here. I'm like, fuck yeah. Uh, I got the, the creepings of autumn where I'm at right now. It's just starting to get a little chilly. I love it. It's perfect weather. And I was, after we're done with this, I'm going outside. Yeah. <laughs> You're going for one of your nature I, swims. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to swim, but I'm getting outside. Yeah. I was well impressed with your matching uh, chair that you got that matches your backdrop, <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> yeah, this this entire room, you do the entire room, even the ceiling is it's just yes, everything. Yes, I love it's, that. It's a, it's a psychedelic room that I have yet to do psychedelics in. So <laughs> straight awesome. in on the psychedelic chat again. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> no, I um, we need to go camping together someday, us three. Rob, obviously, oh, yeah. uh, we know you're a fan of the, the great outdoors as well. Have oh, you been God. out and about camping recently? recently since we last spoke yeah i did uh, i did two big camping trips uh i do i do a big camping trip every year i go up to this place called bernie falls which is about six hours northeast of here uh and it's it's this natural waterfall that's fucking huge huge waterfall and then it goes and it feeds this lake and this lake is then you can wakeboard on the lake and you can have like they got little docks there and you can park the boat they don't have gas on the lake, but you can just take it out and go get gas in town. So uh, we do that. We did that for a week this time. It was like the longest we've been up there, and it was, I mean, it was 106 every day, and it was wow. just freaking gort wakeboarding and drinking beer and in the sun, and it was awesome, man. It was. I don't know if it gets much better than that, dude. I grew up on a lake, and uh, I recently did it up at Lake George here in New York with my girl. We rented a boat, and we just anchor and jump off and just yeah. park just so much fucking fun man what a great way to spend time right it is and it's the whole family and then we go we go with a bunch of friends and so they bring their kids so our kids have friends to play with and you know we got the cornhole game and we've got some you know little volleyball things and badminton and and then we they've got some they've got like somebody made a uh, a rope swing and dude, I don't know. Like, I can't do the rope swing. It kicks my ass. <laughs> like, fucking, my core muscles are just fucking yeah. dead. Like after doing the rope swing like twice. But my kids will go. And you know, I got there's 17 and 14 now. They'll go just, you know, 50 times in a row. Crazy. Yeah. Rope swing. Dude, so that was like, me when I was a kid. I did the same thing. It's all about the knot placement. You can have the knots in the certain area so you can hold yourself up, dude. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Wow. So yeah, I was gonna, actually going to ask you about how old your kids were because I mean you're creating great memories with your family. That's rad. That's awesome. Yeah. And at, that, and at that age for them still to like be down to hang and, and not be dicks. That's nice. <laughs> no, they're, they're all cool. You know, I mean, they get, we do got to kind of cut the phone off when like we're camping and luckily where we are, there's no cell phone reception at all. There's no data. There's no, they can't even get a phone call. Uh, not that anybody would call them because who, <laughs> what 17 year old is making phone calls. They're yeah. only texting. And yeah. so, uh, we, it, it is. It's some really good family hang time. And that's the part about it that I love the most is just being able to kick it with them. We, and then at the night, we just kick it around the fire and we'll just talk and joke. And, you know, I brought my guitar and I'm singing some songs that, every, you know, almost everybody knows. And we just fuck around and, and jam. It's killer. 
I love how into family you are. That's that's rad. It's definitely a, a big part of who I am too. I mean, my family's far away, but whenever we get together, it's that same thing. Just get together and have fun. We do board games, you know, drinking, hanging out. It's great. Yeah. Love it. It's funny because it's it's kind of a contrast to who the guy you used to be back in the day. You know, I was talking to Matt about this early before we came on. I just remember you having such a reputation for being such a madman, like a crazy man back in the day. And that's that's the guy that I remember seeing on, you know, TV and videos and be like, that dude's crazy. He's awesome. You know, when you had the corn rolls and the, right, and the pizza, right. he just looked fierce. I remember seeing it as a young kid. I was still in high school when Burn My Eyes came out. I remember seeing seeing you, just the visual of you. I was like, dude, this guy, he looks like he could do some damage. So it's interesting, the contrast we were, of we who you pretty become, crazy. who you were, you know, back then. It's so interesting. I mean, I think I had to change. Like, there's no way that I kept up, that I could have kept being the person that I was. I mean, I was a fucking drug dealing, gun toting fucking maniac. Like, I would fight people. Like, I was getting in fights like three times a week. It was insane. You know, like, like I just was constantly at war with the world. And, you know, I think, you know, part, part of Machine Head was to get me out of that world you know like i i was just in a band you know i was in violence i was in forbidden i was just thrash and i was you know kind of lost in some ways doing drugs and but you know i wasn't really like this violent dude really and then somewhere around you know the end of violence and the beginning of machine head i just kind of i didn't have any way to make money and so i was started dealing speed and i was good at it <laughs> and uh you know i started making good money and and I remember the people that I was buying it off of, like they had this intermediary guy who was kind of like a college, just kind of like a college nerd looking dude. Like you wouldn't even, you, like this dude wore like tweed suits and like you wouldn't even think that this guy was carrying around like some of the strongest methamphetamines in the entire Northern California. But, you know, then he'd take off his sunglasses and you'd see how sunken in his eyeballs were and you'd be like, oh shit. <laughs> like, yeah, you've been, yeah, I guess you are using this. And I wasn't using it. So I had gone through kind of a crazy drug period and then I got, clean and I was just drinking basically. And I made this weird, uh, it's a, I look back on it and I think it's such a weird promise to make yourself. But I was just like, okay, if you're going to sell drugs, you can't do your drugs. Like you can't get high on your own supply. And like somewhere in my stupid 20 year old brain, like I like made this like a reality. So like I started dealing drugs and never did it. So I just would refuse to do drugs. And, uh, and this dude just is like, hey, man, like we could give you like a ton, like we could give you like $20,000 worth of speed. And I was like, what? Like, you know, it fucking scared the shit out of me. Like it really fucking scared the shit out of me. And, uh, and I was just like, no, like I, and like, I literally like <laughs> when he said that I fast forwarded like two years and I'm like, I'm dead or in jail. Like that's all, yeah. the, that's the only path this is. And I'm like, I you know, that was kind of like my moment that I was, I really needed to make machine head work. And so I just focused all that, but I was still kind of dealing and, you know, I was just around crazy people and violent people all the time. And, and, you know, I don't know if I, I wouldn't say I was a troublemaker, but I was kind of a trouble magnet. <laughs> I don't know, you know, like I didn't, really go looking for it but it just kind of ended up there and so uh yeah i mean i you know i look back on that guy and i don't i don't really know who that guy is anymore you know i don't want to be that guy like i don't miss that guy and i know fan, there's a certain part of the fan base that like really wants that like thugged out like go get in fights three times a week dude and uh and i i get that like i'm a fan of bands too and i i you know i want master of puppets james hetfield <laughs> back you yeah. know but but it's never going to happen and and you know so when people say that i'm like i get it but I, that's just not you know i don't know if that's ever who i really was and it's definitely not who i am now yeah you can't sustain that type of a lifestyle it's it's unrealistic to think that because you're right you're either dead or in jail with people like that period that's it that's really the end game yeah. and you it's crazy, man, to think back on that shit. I know. I don't even identify who, who I was when I was younger either, but with nowhere near <laughs> that tough and cool. <laughs> For sure.
I don't even know if I was that tough. I wasn't even that good of a fighter. I just was crazy. <laughs> like I would just fight anybody. You know, like that was that was the, all I had really, and that worked. You know, like it worked especially for the the line of work that I was in. <laughs> like it was better to be crazy than you know. So I had a couple of friends who were really. I had this one friend. I'm not going to say anybody's name because they're in jail and shit. But I had this one friend. We'll call him Mark. And uh, this dude was like, like I wasn't that good of a fighter, but I would fight. This dude actually was like his brain was mechanically wired to fight people <laughs> like he was the best fighter i've ever known ever in my life like this dude could take on any motherfucker and like he would just find and he wasn't he was like you know he's kind of sh a little bit shorter than me stockier than me though but like it doesn't matter how big the dude was like he could take any motherfucker on and win it was crazy like it was just fucking this dude was wired to fight and so we hung around a lot you know <laughs> <laughs> were you a happy kid rob like do you have happy memories of childhood or was you you kind of like troubled and angry from from a young age um i mean i would say that I mean, I definitely had some childhood traumas that made me, you know, uh, you know, I think about like, I mean, I was happy in, in many respects and you know, I had friends and we'd go see Star Wars, you know, and like I was crazy about Star Wars. So I was super OCD, like just always going to see, I mean, I saw stores in the movies like a million times, like all of them. And, uh, you know, so stuff like that's great memories. I mean, going to, I, I got super into anime and like the early like Space Cruiser Yamato and Robotech and, and a bunch of like the horror. So I'd go to the horror conventions and the science fiction conventions and I was crazy about it. And me and my friends, it was, it was good times, you know, but I, I do, you know, I did go through some pretty heavy duty, uh, traumas, like some significant traumas as, you know, when I was younger and, you know, I can remember times when, you know, like even now, like when I hear a train and the, like, I, I don't live near train tracks now and I never ever want to live near train tracks because I used to live near the train tracks. And I just remember being like five years old and like crying in my bed and hearing the train tracks, you know, like just kind of trying to process these things that had happened to me. And so when, whenever I hear a train now, that's what I think of, you know, like I think of me crying, being, being this kid crying in my bed you know, trying to process all this shit that had, you know, gone on in my life. And, you know, so like those aren't, I don't know if I'd say I was a happy child because of that, but you know, those and, and those memories still memories. loom large as well. I would think so. Yeah. I mean, like if I hear a train now, like it kind of instantly takes me there and then I forget about it. I'm just like, whatever, you know, like I'm not there anymore. Wow. That's wild. It's amazing what can trigger your brain into memories something as simple as the sound of a train yeah there was a train my tra there was a train tracks and then there was a bart station right down the street from my house so bart's like the subway yeah. and so you know we were in a kind of like a white trash you know lower middle class area so you know that's where all the trains are right like all the housing is built around the train. so you hear the fucking trains all goddamn night you know you hear the can hear the bart train and the fucking you know so 5 a.m starts happening and you start hearing trains go by wow what age did you start um, using drugs yourself or drinking? Was drinking first? Um, no, uh, weed was first. My uh, my dad had a twin brother, or has a twin brother, and uh, they both kind of they but they both kind. My dad was like, and they both joined the army. My dad then finished the army, be became a extremely dedicated uh like activist protester you know like went to all the protests went and saw martin luther king um protest the vietnam war march for women's rights and so like he kind of went from like straight on military guy to then super into the hippie movement you know so like kind of you know this <laughs> wild about face really because like you know kind of the farthest opposite poles you could be at least yeah, in yeah. the 60s for sure and um and so he started smoking weed a lot, grew his hair out, grew a big old beard and a big old mustache. I just remember, I remember being a kid, like he had this giant fucking mustache, like two inches long. And, uh, you know, he, he would smoke a pipe in, in the house and drink beer. So he would smoke like a tobacco pipe, like a full on, like old school, like proper English pipe. 
and uh, <laughs> and then uh, and then he'd smoke weed too in the garage. And like you know, I couldn't really tell the difference, although I could smell the difference. And so uh, I remember being at a party. I was probably like six years old, and uh, we were over at my uncle Ronald's, his twin brothers, and uh, all my cousins were there. And my uncle Ronald was smoking a pipe, and I was like, "Oh, can I have a hit of your pipe?" Because my dad would let me hit his pipe, and. Uh, so I was like, oh, can I have a hit of your pipe? He's like, you want to have a hit of my pipe? I was like, yeah. He's like, my dad lets me hit the pipe. And he's like, oh, okay. And I hit it. I just remember like within like 20 minutes, just the whole like party kind of went like this. And I'm like walking around and everything's kind of sideways. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, you know, I've, I didn't put any of this together until like way later. But, you know, now knowing that everybody, you know, they're all a bunch of fucking hippies. They're just smoking weed everywhere in front of their kids. They don't fucking care. You know, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So was that? But when did you like actually embrace? This is, six, it? this is six years old. I'm I'm smoking weed for the first time. You know, not by choice, but you yeah. know, by accident. That's hysterical. When when did it come into play? Like you know, when you were older and you embraced it, and you were like, "Yeah, this is." I was, I was pretty it. young. I want to say thirteen. I want to say I was smoking. I was drinking and smoking at thirteen, junior high. Oh. I wasn't that, I wasn't quite that early. I think for me, it was around 15. I was a late bloomer. All my friends were doing it, but you know, I was brought up such a strict thing. It was like such a taboo thing. But the moment I tried it at the age of 15, I loved that shit. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. I didn't necessarily love it. You know, like weed to me, like I did like drinking. It was funny. I remember like the first time I went drinking, like I don't remember even getting drunk. Like I just was I was like, I don't think it's working. <laughs> like we kept on trying to drink. My friend stole the bottle of uh, Tanqueray out of his parents' liquor cabinet. You know, tank Tanqueray is like a gin. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so they're like, let's. Just, we're drinking it. We're drinking in his in his backyard, and I'm like, I don't, I don't feel anything. Like, what's what, what's supposed to happen? You know, like because you don't know what's supposed to happen, right? The first time that you drink alcohol, <laughs> like. So I, uh, I fucking loved my first booze experience. I was just instantly bitten by that bug. I was like, I love the effects. I love everything about feeling drunk and getting drunk, the taste, everything. It was hooch. You remember that drink? Did you have hooch in the States? It's like an alka pop. So it's like a kind of fizzy lemonade, but alcoholic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's probably way better than what we were drinking. We are drinking fucking straight tank. <laughs> <out of the laughs> it's fucking shit. horrible. I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> Why does anybody drink this? <laughs> What yeah. about the kind of like harder drugs, Rob? Were they in the music kind of community that you were hanging around with, or did that come from a different area of, of your neighborhood? Like, how was the kind of like speed and, and drugs like that first introduced to you? Was it through the thrash scene or? No, I, uh, I mean, we knew about it. I was already in a band, you know, when I was, I was getting ready to graduate high school and uh, I was already in a band. I was jamming in Forbidden. Uh, it was forbidden evil at that time, but it was forbidden. And um, I was playing with, we were, I think we had played some, we, we had played some like high school gigs and, uh, but you know, we were still mainly just drinking and, and, and a little bit of smoking here and there, actually quite a bit of smoking. I did go through a big heavy weed phase and it, you know, it's funny cause I couldn't really talk on weed. Like I still can't really like right now, if I was high, I would be the worst interview you've ever had on your podcast. <laughs> I would just be like, uh, like I, I'd think something, and then by the time it came out of my mouth, it'd just be nothing at all. Like what I was, I'm like, what the fuck is? I am the, I'm the, the only thing I can do on weed is listen to music and have sex. <laughs> like, that's literally, that's it. two things more than me. All I can do is sit there in paranoia and just be like, oh fuck, I get oh, fuck, super, oh, fuck. I get super paranoid. Yeah, I get crazy paranoid. <laughs> I get crazy like fucking. I can't fucking concentrate or think. I can listen to music though. Like I can fucking just dissect hone in music. I can hone in and like hear every hi-hat hit and like i i used to love doing that i really loved that about you know so you certainly my earliest musical kind of getting turned on to early metal and stuff i was high and i'd be listening i was like wow this is crazy and uh and so uh you know i think when i finally got around to speed it was it was just a dude in my high school it was like the last it was actually our graduation party and he was like dude i got some speed i was like what's that He's like, let's just do it and see what happens. And I was like, okay. And we just, and it was crazy because I was pretty introverted throughout all of my high school. And certainly whenever I was stoned, I fucking, I, like I said, I couldn't even talk to anybody. So like nobody ever heard me talk because I was always high in my classes. 
and uh, or frying on mescaline in my in the back of my class and just <laughs> laughing my fucking ass off and so uh you know i go we go to these all these parties and we do some speed and suddenly i'm just like brah what's up and they're like dude you're fucking crazy like what's up with you like i haven't talked to you the whole school year now you're like fucking you know the life of the party and you know something about that definitely you know it definitely appealed to me i i had i had never been that i had never been the life of a party before and hearing all these you know, high school students, my fellow high school students who I really hadn't even talked to prior to this party for four years, you know, just like fucking let's, like, let, you know, just, it was a, it was a crazy moment. And, and, and a big part of why I then started doing speed a lot because I wanted to be that guy again. Like I wanted to be the life of the party again. Like I wanted to go talk to people and girls that I was too, insecure to talk to or had too much you know self n not no self-confidence to talk to it's almost like you get to the age of like 16 and then you see your first full moon right and that werewolf transformation takes place but you know quite late in life and then you go oh i like this i want to be this guy more i think a, yeah. a lot of people can relate to that like whether it is alcohol or coke or pills whatever it is it's that thing that takes you out of your own head and you know kind of gives you that fake confidence right that we all need right. sometimes when we're young and figuring out who we are did you have a similar thing jesse what was your kind of like oh yeah yeah 100 percent. i can completely relate to everything he just said i was definitely the introvert i didn't talk much and when i did smoke i had my headphones on i was listening to bob marley or the beastie boys or some bad brains and i had my close close knit of friends that kind of knew me to be that guy and then i discovered acid acid was the first gateway drug of like I'm making jokes. People are laughing at my shit. I'm like, wow. I'm like you said, talking to girls I would never talk to before, and they think I'm charming. And I'm like, wow, this is fucking cool. So I started doing it on a regular basis my senior year, and then that led into me. You know, I was in a band as well, going to clubs, going to shows, doing little road trips, and always had acid or mescaline or angel dust i always had something on angel but, dust. yeah i did with dude angel dust too actually when i first met mike d from uh kill switch who was in a band called overcast um i was offering him and the whole band brian fair i was like dude you guys want to smoke some dust and like they're like no <laughs> <laughs> no dude you're crazy, no, you crazy. Like, crazy. Dude, you? <laughs> so yeah I, that i totally i think i kind of needed that little bit of a uh, you know i needed to go through that because i now that I don't, you know, I'm not on that shit all the time, but like I needed to like open up and figure out who I was. And it kind of helped me become yeah. sociable. I, yeah. I mean, I, you know, as much as I, I don't want to sit here and, you know, I've got a 17 year old. I certainly don't want to advocate for drugs, but like in, in my case, it definitely for, a, for a minute, it kind of helped me come out of my introverted shell. You know, it helped me, you know, just get over some mental roadblocks that I had in, you know, I didn't have a lot of, you know, I was adopted. So my, you know, I, although I did live with my cousins and so I basically had like brothers and sisters, you know, my cousins were kind of always, we had a very dysfunctional family. So my family would always have like, you know, like, eh, I just got kicked out of the house. So they'd come and stay with us for, you know, a year. And then, uh, but so but I just didn't have like that kind of like social, you know, I think sometimes when, you know, people have that come from like, you know, wealthier families and good backgrounds, like they have like this kind of socialization, they have a socialization that is very positive for them. They can go up and talk to anybody and they, you know, they kind of have this built in confidence. And, you know, I think coming from where I came from and what I went through as a child and, you know, part of it, part of some stuff with being like adopted and abandonment issues, you know, like it was very, very hard for me to go socialize with people. And I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't, I, you know, I was too in my head to go talk to people. And so I spent a lot of time alone and I was a lot of time just kind of in my own head with music or with guitar or with singing or, you know, but then at the same time, I had this really powerful drive to be on stage 
you know, so when the school would have a, like a, like a talent show, like I was the first person to sign up, you know, like I was like, I want to be on, I want to go sing a song. And, or if we were having like, like if we were going to be, you know, we had a play about, you know, the Easter bunny, like, or Peter rabbit or whatever. Like I was going to be Peter rabbit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm going to be Peter rabbit. Like I had this, like, I want to be the main guy on the play. And, uh, and somehow with that, I could like really express myself and you know, like I could totally become whatever I needed to become for the, the acting or the song or whatever. And it was, you know, looking back on it now, I can kind of see what it was, but at the time I didn't put that together. It was just like, Oh, I just really enjoy this. And so, you know, and I was pretty competitive. Like I, I was in jujitsu. I started taking jujitsu about third grade and I was super into, I mean, I was fucking upset. I wanted to be Bruce Lee. Like ah. I would just watch Bruce Lee movies and Jackie Chan movies and Chuck Norris movies. And just like, I wanted to fucking match every fucking move. And I had nunchucks and I had swords and I had, you know, like I, I was like fucking all in. And my dad had this, um, my dad who grew up in, uh, Alameda, which is this right next door to Oakland, the city right next to Oakland. And, uh, he took me to this awesome, awesome, uh, sensei named uh, Wally J and he had this dojo and it was a pretty big dojo. So there was a lot of kids my age going there and I'd get there. We'd get there a half an hour before the class started. I'd stay 45 minutes after the class. I mean, I was obsessed with jujitsu and, you know, and I got, I got pretty good and I wanted to spar all the time. The, the Wally J would stay after and spar with me all the time. I'm like, I mean, he'd kick my ass too. Like, you know, he'd fucking slam me on the ground and like, but he, he's like, you're strong. You're strong like bull. And just like trying to build up my confidence. And, and I was just all into it. And I just wanted that. And, uh, it was, it was really like, he became this, you know, this mentor to me that really, really like brought a lot of confidence out of me and really helped me believe in myself and feel good about like being able to defend myself because there was like a lot of fucking, you know, even at my, at my school, there was just like people who wanted to beat up, you know, there's like the bullies and then the kids who get bullied. And I was not the bully. I was one of the kids that would get bullied. So he would just fucking help me. And, uh, and really just, you know, I still remember the, you're strong, you're strong, like bull. And I just forever now that is rung in my head. And if I'm ever down, you know, I just remember those words and I remember, you know, sparring with them. And I remember like getting out from his things and, you know, I just put myself back in that place. And, and it was, a it was a very powerful moment in my life to, to get that. I got, a, I got about halfway, I got to an orange belt, which is uh, halfway to a black belt in his dojo. And then my family moved and we couldn't really continue on with him anymore. Is that when you went pedal to the metal with music? Well, I joined another, I, I joined another dojo and, um, and this was like, this was, this wasn't really even a dojo. This was just like dudes that were working out of like the high school gym. And, uh, it was a totally different vibe. Like I really didn't like the teacher and I was 13. We had just moved. So I was 13 and we moved to a place called Fremont, which was Fremont compared to where I was living was actually like a step up. It was like kind of just like a regular, you know, California suburb, you know, about 50 miles away from San Francisco. And, uh, and I was 13 and I was sparring up against dudes who were 15, which doesn't seem like that big of a difference when you're like on paper, but like, I'm still a gangly like kid and these dudes are turning into men, <laughs> you know, like their muscles and, you know, ch abs and, and dude, like they fucking leveled me. Like they kicked my fucking ass. And, uh, just because of that. And then so that because I was getting my ass kicked regularly at this dojo, the, the teacher demoted me from an orange belt back down to a yellow belt. What? I didn't and, even know you could do that in martial arts. Yeah. Oh. And I was like, that was it. I was like, fuck you. I don't even like you anyway. <laughs> like, fucking. Yeah, way to take the fucking wind out of yourselves. Shit. That sucks. Yeah. 
And so that was kind of like my moment where like I, you know, I started smoking weed. I think the week after that, I start smoking weed. I'm hearing Black Sabbath for the first time. I'm like, I want to fucking get snow blind. I want to fucking smoke sweet leaf. You know, like fucking, I want to be Iron Man, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. went down that route. And then, you know, pretty soon was hanging out with like kind of a bad crowd. And, and uh, you know, we're smoking a lot of weed. We're cutting school. And then I started hanging out with this guy, Jim Pittman, who uh, he's in my art class. And he's super cool and he's you know he's not like any of these kids that i'm hanging out with he's like i don't smoke weed like i don't really drink like i'm just but he's like super funny and we totally hit it off and becomes like my really good friend and uh and he turns me on to thrash metal like he turns me on to early metallica he turns me on to accept he turns me on to saxon and kind of like the early new wave of british you know iron maiden and motley Crue, like all this kind of early you know 80s under these are the bands that are coming out of the underground like this is not any you know this is not popular at this point at all i mean and they just named every popular band you know, <laughs> maiden and metallica but this is yeah, like but then, nobody knows then. Who these bands are <laughs> so uh yeah so that became a big thing and then he's just like you know he kind of pushes me i give him more credit i was very you know, i was definitely musical and i always wanted to perform and i could sing but he kind of i give him credit with pushing me towards being you know a band member you know we didn't have a bass player so he's like hey why don't you or we didn't have a sorry we didn't have a guitar player so he's like why don't you play guitar and like you seem like you're the guitar player and i was like okay so i talked my dad into renting a guitar for 45 dollars from uh, allegro music so 45 dollars for three months like, he rents me like an area pro with an amp about this big it's like four four inches four inch by four inch amp and uh but it's enough like we can go into the garage and fucking we i could i got dark and we're just we suck basically for six months in his parents garage and it's it's the best you know like we're just you know we're just trying to learn how to play anything you know we can play like seek and destroy we're like yeah that's easy jun, 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 you know so shit like that and uh and it's it's killer and then pretty soon we don't have a singer so he's just like you know, like you seem like you're the singer. Why don't you? Why don't you be the singer? And and that's why I became the singer. You know, you know, like he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Even though I wanted to sing, like I never would have thought I could sing for a band. You know, like and he just kind of pushed me there, and then so I become the singer for the band as well. And then I don't. We get a guitar player who's actually really good. So the first couple of shows I do, I'm just the singer. I'm not even the guitar player. I'm just the singer. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I got to get some moves. I'm like, I slide. I do a knee slide at one point. And I'm like, I got <laughs> yeah. like, to get some fucking moves, man. I'm the singer. <laughs> wow. So do you still keep in touch with that? With this this guru who who uh, kind of made you who you are? You know what? I, I do when I don't. I, uh, I, end up, I end up firing him at some point, like a couple of years down the line. And I get Paul Bostaff, his cousin, Paul Bostaff, who later is in Slayer. You know, I get him into Forbidden. I get Paul into into the band. And this is his cousin. So then it's like this giant fallout between us because you fired me for my cousin. Oh, my God. Like, we, you and I started the band. It was like, it was pretty ugly. We're still friends and we see each other from time to time and I'll hit him up. But we're, you know, I, I, there might not be anything between us even at this point. But I just have this guilt <laughs> from all these years yeah. later that i carry with me because i you know i don't know and i just find it hard to reach out to him you were kids man <laughs> i know i know i know it's so dumb but i'm just like i i'm just like fuck you know i think about texting and i'm like ah it's fuck it's funny though because when you are kids like a band that kind of has a member shift that can break up the whole neighborhood gang kind yeah. of it can get so political and it can get so heated and intense that these relationships and it's a family member you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking cousin <laughs> you know and it's like oh it's my God. So then it like ends their fucking you know they're not friends i was like jesus christ it's just a mess you know when paul joined slayer i was like this is uh, i actually played paul bostaff i played him rain and blood for the first time he was like all into rush he didn't even barely listen to thrash and i played that he's like this is super satanic man i don't want to listen to this <laughs> <laughs> and then later on in slayer i'm like what the fuck <laughs> did you remind yeah. him of that moment i did i did totally he loves it he's he thinks it's funny now but 
I got to tell you, man, I, I've known you for a while. We've, we've hung out. We've had conversations, but I didn't know you had the talent show theater martial arts thing. That was 100% how I got my start. I hung out with theater kids, and then I was super, like you, into martial arts. I used to wear geese to school. I used to pull my hair back on a ponytail. I had Bruce Lee on my wall. I slept on a rice mat. I'm not joking. I had no oh, friends. Oh, sure. That's awesome. <laughs> I used to burn incense and meditate. I was that kid. And up until I met my first punk rock friend who basically was like, you're going to sing in my band. Like the parallels of everything you just said, I'm just biting my tongue letting you tell your story. I'm like, how the fuck? So similar. It's nuts. I was obsessed wow. with martial arts. It's crazy. It, I mean, especially I think that, you know, growing up too, like there was something about that era that martial arts definitely – Everybody was there kung was, fu. Fighting. There was a lot of fucking great martial arts movies, you know. For one, like it was very popular. It's not like now when, in like now, it's all about like superhero movies. Yeah. You know? Back then, superheroes were the martial artists. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, you mentioned Chuck Norris. I was a huge Chuck Norris fan too. I mean, yeah, obsessed with all that shit. It's so fucking funny. Yeah, and then I discovered punk rock, and I just was I walked away from all of it. Totally di disappointing my my sifu because it was Chinese styles. My sifu we just. But yeah, I, I if with without that, I wouldn't have like you said confidence, like learning how to be confident outside of. That's just wild. It blew my mind. I didn't know that about you. That was fascinating right to hear. Right on, man. <laughs> how did you two first connect? When did you first meet? Do you remember? Do you remember it the same way? Um, I think we've talked about this before, and I think I got it wrong. So, Rob, do you remember? <laughs> I want to say it was either at a seamless show in San Francisco. Or it was some like, or like maybe like Roadrunner United or something. I think that's what it was, Roadrunner yeah. United. But, you know, that was brief. I think the impact, the, the memory that I have that impacted me most was you sitting next to me at an airport in Australia when Times of Grace went out to, uh, you know, we were both doing the sound wave and we did the sideshows with you and sitting at the airport with you and you, you sat right next to me and you just kind of were like, hey, man this record's great and help, thank you for this and helped me. And I was like, whoa, that's wild. Okay. Yeah, dude. Awesome. I'm trying to play it cool. And I'm like, dude, Rob Flynn's giving me compliments. It's fucking nuts. That's the first time I remember connecting with you and just being like, whoa, that's crazy. Right. And then flash forward to us swimming in you know, me, you, Adam swimming in the Indian ocean. And yes, uh, fucking that was killer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. It's funny, man. Like I've always been a fan, but, it's really nice to we didn't cross paths a lot like back in the day oh no, not really no no because i mean honestly i wasn't on the road a lot for yeah. a good chunk of time i was away i walked away from the whole metal scene you mentioned seamless but even with seamless like i think we toured with in flames but other than that we were touring bands like fu manchu and it was that stoner rock scene so i really wasn't crossing paths with m many metal bands at the time purposely yeah. i just got away from after kill switch i didn't want anything to do with metal for a while Needed, yeah, my know. drummer was way into Seamless, and so we went and caught your show at the Slims. I think you guys played Slims in San Francisco, and uh, right. we we talked to you for a second, but you know, I think you were just you know doing thing. I was and also we, very we had never met, so I was like, I don't even know if this dude knows who I am. We're just like, hey, what's up? I'm Robert. And I was probably extremely nervous uh, and a very introverted at that time. I had not shed my my skin and become a real human then <laughs> yet. <laughs> Still a baby alien. Yeah, I was. Yeah, fucking weird kid, <laughs> weird guy. Going back to your kind of like younger, wilder years, Rob. Was there a time when you were like peak angry, out of control, pissed at the world? And what would that have been, time wise and 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 headspace? Where were you at when it was at its worst, or maybe just wildest? But not bad. <laughs> I mean, I mean, from a, you know, I. I so I, I leave Forbidden and then I join Violence and that's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's kind of crazy then, like it's just starting to get into a few fights, just starting to lose <laughs> a lot of fights, <laughs> you know, like, but you know, fighting more and uh, drinking more. And then this is kind of like when I first start, you know, I had, I had had a couple of girlfriends you know, when I was in Forbidden here and there, but I now start getting like, you know, girls like, like us, you know what I mean? Like 
I play my first show with Forbidden at a club called Ruthie's Inn, and you know, this, I get my first groupie, and I'm like, oh my god, this girl's like 21, I'm 18. You know, I'm just like, this is fucking amazing, holy shit. And you know, I'd always, I'd always heard Lemmy say that, like, you know, the reason that you get into a band is to get laid, and I was like, he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest so right when you're a kid that's why everybody starts it's got to be occasionally yeah. there'll be someone who just loves the music but most dudes especially dudes yeah. <laughs> are you that guy jesse you just I, love the music. i was 100 percent about the message and the hardcore pride and changing the world yeah i wasn't about I, the. i was i was about both <laughs> i was have your cake and eat it too i was i was about the the music and the thrash and then you know girls coming around was a huge benefit because i had no game <laughs> like i could not i could I had zero game like i could and that's why i was so stoked when this girl like starts talking to me after this show at ruthie's i was just like oh my god like this is a fucking this chick's talking to me like this chick would never be talking to me if i was if i didn't just play this show right now open this show for metal church uh, you know on, yeah. just on new year's eve first of five and uh so it was cool and uh you know i think you know, I, I did get, I did end up getting a girlfriend. I started dating our manager's daughter. And, uh, but then we went on the road shortly after, you know, like I was, I was torn up and down the California when I was 19. And so, you know, girl, you know, girl, I, I, I wanted to be uh, monogamous to my girlfriend, but I just found it incredibly hard because now girls were finally talking to me. <laughs> and so, you know, they just kind of fall in my lap and I was like, uh, fuck what am i supposed to do and uh and that happened a lot and then we go on tour I'm, i go on tour when i'm 20 with uh, violence and violence is opening for testament across the u.s for two months and uh even though the manager goes with it's debbie abono who's a wonderful lady she's like this you know she's 60 at the time and she's touring with a bunch of fucking 19 and 20 year olds in a van for two months opening for testament i mean she's she's a fucking angel among mortals and i'm just like you know we're pulling over at the fucking side of the road and she's got like a bag of fucking quarters and she's just pumping quarters into a payphone to like advance shows and you know oh the boy yeah the boys don't need any food no we're like we need food yeah what do you what get some food from them <laughs> like so that kind of stuff and and uh you know like i'm sneaking off into the the men's bathroom with chicks <laughs> like i'm just like uh so bad but you know what are you gonna do i was 20 good times to be a young man yeah, on the road it was i turned 21 on the road yeah i turned 21 on the road it was pretty cool on the wow. testament tour that's pretty sick dude yeah it was a good memory we played cleveland oh, ohio it was a good memory so when when does Machine Heads right after Violence and when yeah. when does Machine Heads like start to when do you have the sense that you're becoming successful and this is like going to be a thing like well I'm in Violence for f four years from eighty seven to ninety one and then I quit in you know it, like Violence in you know you know i i felt like we made a mark i loved the music that we made you know especially eternal nightmare to me i thought was just a phenomenal thrash record and Hell yeah you know at the time nobody really like people either loved our singers vocals which were very punk rock i mean there's no melody it's just this frantic na, 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 and it was fucking awesome like it was killer i loved it you know and i loved punk rock i loved discharge i loved hardcore like i was all about it like to me we were you know, we could play with GBH and Suicidal and The Accused and all these hardcore bands, or we could play with Exodus and Forbidden and Possess, you know, all these thrash metal bands. You know, we could walk that, and we did. You know, we played with all those bands. And um, so when, you know, it kind of it kind of runs its course, like we put out a couple of records, and, you know, at the time, the we were like the third wave of thrash, in my opinion. Like we, you know, thrash, like our first record was 88, so like, you know, south of heavens already coming out you know injustice for all like it's kind of gone through you know a lot already and um you know i just kind of felt like it was at the end and it was kind of like it, the scene started changing like that kind of thrash funk thing came around that horrible thrash <laughs> funk that came out in like the late 80s early 90s and i was like what is this and you know i like chili peppers and i like primus but like i just didn't like all that like all the thrash bands tried to go there 
and then Metallica drops the Black Album, and it's just fucking, it's over. Like, you know, here they are playing fucking stadiums now. They're playing Oakland Stadium, and everybody's like, we're going to go to the Black Album. And and I didn't want to do that. Like, I didn't feel like violence could do that. Like, we didn't have a singer who could sing. And, you know, I was like, if we're just going to do this, let's just be thrash because, you know, this is, we can't do that. You know, like, we're, we're not able to do that. And uh, so I get a little disillusioned. And then um, Metallica plays a Day on the Green, which was a big kind of famous festival, Bill Graham Festival. And uh, they headline, and it's for the Black Album. And it's them, Faith No More, uh, Soundgarden. And I'm watching this, and I'm just like, I could just sense, like, everything's changing. Mm. And I'm not going to get left behind. You know, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a new band, and I'm gonna start a side project. At the beginning, it was just a side project, but I, I go and tell everybody um, in the band, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm gonna start a side project called Machine Head, and I, I had brought in a couple songs to Broughton. I had brought a couple of songs to Violence, and they had rejected it. And uh, I was like, I'm gonna take these songs, and I'm gonna do, it. and then, and everybody was cool with it, and then. Uh, and then at this point, I'm, you know, now I'm dealing drugs. I'm kind of getting really crazy. Like I'm pretty out of hand. I'm, I've broken up with my girlfriend. I'm just like, now I'm just hanging out with strippers and, you know, I'm fucking going crazy. I'm like sex addict. I'm hanging out with other sex addicts, you know, like, and it's just wild. And, uh, and I get in this, my, my, there's this crazy incident that happens at a gas station. I'm, I'm leaving a Deftones. Deftones are opening for this local band called Unjust. It's a Sunday night at the Omni in Oakland, in this in a pretty rough part of Oakland that was where all the thrash shows happened and where many shows happened. And uh, my friend, who was the really good fighter, starts fighting this white... We go to the gas station. We got a bunch of girls, and we're like, let's go to the gas station. We'll get some booze, and then we'll go party at my house. And uh, so we get, we get to the gas station to get some booze, and then while we're getting booze, my friend who's the super good fighter gets in a fight with this white guy at the gas station, just like a guy leaving, also leaving the same show. And, uh, so we pull up, we're, we're, we're walking out of the gas station and we're like, Oh my God, Mark's fighting again. And, uh, so we just, you know, you just, st- you just pull up and you wait for your friend to make sure everything's okay. And you're like, all right, I guess I'm just, you know, I know he's going to be fine. Like he's the fucking best fighter I know. And then, these three black girls from the neighborhood walk up also to the store. They're going to buy some last minute booze for their Sunday night party. And like we were, and they start watching it. And you know, this is in fucking Oakland, like to see two white boys at a gas station fighting is like seeing a unicorn. <laughs> you know, like they're just like, Oh my God, look at these crazy white boys fighting. And they just like, they're laughing and they're hanging out and we're like, we're laughing. Like, it's like a, it, I don't want to say it's like a good vibe, but like, it's just, kind of, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like, we're just, it's like the entertainment, you know? And they're like the fact that they're laughing so hard that these two white dudes are fighting at this gas station. That they obviously live right around the corner from and go to is funny. And, uh, but what wasn't funny was these three carloads of black dudes who see these girls and think that they're in trouble. So they pull up to the gas station and, you know, 12 dudes roll out and fucking, I don't know why, but they step to me and they're like, what the fuck are you doing fucking with our black girls? And I'm like, we're, we're just watching my, my friend fight this other guy here. And and, and we're not, we're not fucking with anybody. He's like, no. And he gets up and he's super drunk. These dudes are fucking high and drunk and we're high and drunk. And, and he gets up and he fucking literally like nose to nose. He's like, no, what the fuck are you doing fucking with our black girls? This is like nineties. Like we, you know, fucking this is riots and Rodney King riots. And it's like fucking it's tense. You know, they surround us and I'm, we're like, holy shit. I'm with Adam, our old bass player and the, the guy who's a good fighter. And, uh, and I'm like, this dude's going to f- knock me out. Like, this is my dialogue going in. And I'm just like, dude, I'm like, dude, you've got, you know, you're, you're, you know, that's not what's happening. You know, that's not what's going on. You know, no one's disrespecting anybody. Like we're all just watching our friend, my friend over here fight. 
And but as I'm saying that, I got this inner dialogue going on in my head, like this dude's gonna knock me the fuck. Like there's n like nothing I say is gonna get us out of this. And I was like, I'm not gonna take the first punch. <laughs> like, I was like, fuck that. So at the time, I wear like I I was wearing like nothing but gnarly. I'm always getting in fights, right? So I've just got gnarly rings to so, like fuck people up who I'm fighting. And uh, I fucking just break this dude's nose. I'm just and I literally feel his nose break under my fist and wow. just it's on from that point they fucking jump us and and uh we're doing we're doing pretty good up until that point and like i'm i'm holding my own and uh and like i said i'm you know of the three of us i'm probably the worst fighter i'm just the craziest and they the one of the guys gets behind me you know like the high school trick where the dude gets down on his hands and knees and like your buddy pushes you back over like <laughs> that thing yeah they do that they do that to me and i was like i'm like falling backwards i'm like oh hell no did he just do that high school fucking move <laughs> on me i was like fuck and now i got fucking boots upside my head and i'm like i'm now i'm just mad at myself that that high school trick fucking worked and now i'm on the ground i was like fuck these fucking boots and then and then the next thing i hear is fucking he's got a knife run and uh you know my friend had a knife and he had he had gotten us out of out of that with that knife and he had ended up stabbing a couple of people wow. and uh it was pretty serious man like this guy this was like a serious like a real deal like gang and I was going to say, yeah, imagine if one of them had a gun, like your friend pulls a knife, they pull the gun, then it's game over, isn't it? It's am I mean, like, I look back on some of the things, like moments like that, and it, it is amazing that we that we survived it. Like, we should have all gotten shot. You know, like, there's no reason that they wouldn't have had, got, there's no reason they wouldn't have been packing at all. It might have just been in, my only thing that I could think of was that it was in the trunk of their cars, rather than on them. You know, because it's like the end of a Sunday night. They were probably out partying. They wouldn't have been able to get a gun into the, the club or a bar or wherever they were going. So, you know, we uh, we end up getting out of there. But then for the next like six months, I'm they figure out who I am, that I'm in a band, which is, you know, nominally famous in the Bay Area. And they think they convince themselves that I did it. And I'm like, you know, I end up talking to the guy at one point and or the leader and. And I'm like, I, I didn't do it, you know, but they're just like hell bent on, they're hell bent on killing us, like killing, killing us like dead, you're dead. And so for six months, I sleep with a knife under my pillow. I've got a gun with me at all times. Like the second I step out of the door, I've got a gun or two. I'm borrowing guns off of people that I know. And it's fucking scary. Like it's like, you sleep with one eye open for six months straight, you know, like it was really wow. scary. And, uh, eventually the only thing that kind of, that saved us was that they, the guys that all got in that altercation either were <clears throat> all in jail and more than a few of them were dead from other things that they had gotten into. And, you know, but it was, it was a very transformative, you know, this is all going on during when this other guy is offering me all this drugs. And I'm just like, I got to get any, I, no matter what I got to do here, like I have got to get out of this life. Like I have to fucking change. I have to get, I can't, you know, I can't do this. I don't even want to do this. I don't need, I didn't even want to be a drug dealer. I just was doing it to fucking, you know, get from A to B. Like I never wanted to be in that life. I just, I wanted to make music and that's all, you know, once, once, you know, this was all going down. I just determined, like, I got to fucking save my life with music and get out of this life and and go play. And that's you know, what I put my mind to. That's some gangster shit, though. <laughs> like, legitimately, man. Going from that and an amazing story. First of all, I'd never heard that story. That's incredible. But yeah, it's crazy how like an incident such. A small, a seemingly small incident can escalate to that. Yeah, left that quickly. That's crazy. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that, I'm sure that was a motivator too. I mean, just put the pedal to the metal and get the fuck out and get on the road and and get the band going. Yeah. So at what songs, point was fucking all I would do is just write. I got to write. I got to write songs. I got to write lyrics. I got to write fucking 
you know, we got to play shows and do this. You know, wow. Get signed. Yeah, yeah imagine back. if you hadn't done that. It would have been a, probably a pretty sad, bad ending, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Wow, that's nuts, dude. Yeah, I'm just, I'm picturing the whole incident in my head. I, it's crazy, man, how far, you know, you look back on the telling stories about your, your youth, you look back on that shit to like where you are now. Would you ever have thought, you know, you'd be like a father and like at peace? Because to me, like the guy that I met was already in transition, but the guy that you are now, I feel like you, and correct me if I'm wrong, you seem like you're much more at peace with the world and you're a pretty laid back dude now, <laughs> you know? It's pretty incredible to go from that to there. But the in-between stuff, when Machina was starting to get huge, really, because you guys at one point, to me, were fucking huge. When uh, Burn My Eyes came out and that shit exploded. Yeah. I mean, how did you handle that? Obviously, you were excited, but like, I don't know, did you just jump into that life? And like, yeah, I'm a fucking rock star. I, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I, I look back on it and I feel like I handled it. Uh, I, I'd give myself a four out of 10. <laughs> like if I was holding up Olympic scorecards, <laughs> I would be, I would give myself a four out of 10. You know, I felt like I, um, it w I mean, it was like, it went from zero to a hundred like that. I mean, it was really you know, for a guy and, and granted, I felt like I was ready for it. You know, like I had, like I said, I had already recorded three and a half albums You know, I wrote half the first forbidden record, three albums with violence, two of which at the time were only released, but, um, you know, and I had toured, toured extensively. So I felt like I was, I had paid my dues. I, I, you know, it, it wasn't like going from fucking, you know, playing in my bedroom to, you know, like I had, yeah, I had seasoned myself and I kind of knew, you know, I'd seen other bands get famous and, and so I felt like I knew what to do, but it did happen really, really, really quick, especially overseas in the UK and you know, Europe. It was just like a phenomenon. Like that's all I can explain it. It was just a fucking phenomenon. And, you know, here in America, it was definitely slower, but, you know, we did the, we did the American, the first U S tour we did was opening for obituary and napalm death, which was cool. You know, roadrunner kind of helped put that together and it was, it was good. I mean, certainly up in the East coast by your area, it was awesome. Like our people there loved us. Other pockets of America, like we were either, you know, people were indifferent or just outright hated our guts. <laughs> you know, like, cause like, here's me singing the tiny little bit that I sing in like old and like nation on fire, like at a grindcore death metal show, like fuck that. So, uh, you know, dudes yeah, wanted to fight back us. then that shit didn't fly. No, dudes no. wanted to fight us a lot. And, you know, yeah. we put off that, like we put off that energy too. Like we want to fight, like we'll fight you. Fuck you. You know? So like, <laughs> like there was still some of that going on or still a lot of that going on. And, and, and we, we played it up, you know, I think we, you know, we played up the Oakland thing quite a bit, you know, probably to, you know, almost comical levels at points, you know, like it was like, all right, look, we're not wading through, you know, six inches of <laughs> bullet shells and fucking hypodermic needles. All right. Like it's not, this is not what that is, but it was at that time. And especially the early nineties in the Bay area it was, it was fucking gnarly. Like it was way before the internet boom. And you know, it was, it was fucking gnarly. And so I remember as a kid, like the big bands over here really were like Corn, Deftones, Cold Chamber, and you guys. You guys were like the kind of really big four of that kind of mid 90s metal period. Obviously, a little bit later, it was like System of a Down and Slipknot. But yeah. to begin with, you were the four. And like, you know, we were those, the first of the four. Yeah. Yeah. And all of those bands had this kind of like, you know, the sort of hip hop influence look. But I always remember, and I'm not just saying this, there was always something slightly scarier about yeah, machine yeah, totally, like totally. you know corn no, looked kind of cool and <laughs> yeah. and deftones looked cool and, and cold chamber just looked you know weird but machine head looked fucking gnarly and tough like <laughs> yeah and, there, and we were was, yeah and we were you there know, was like, an undertone of like there was a time when like we would have kicked your ass and fucked your girlfriend in like a heartbeat you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and i don't say that like you know i'm not romanticizing that like i'm not proud of that but we that's what the fucking that's what we would have done you know, like it was just, it was a wild time. And, uh, I mean, I think that, 
I feel like, uh, you know, but I felt like I was ready for it too. You know, I felt like, I felt like I, like when the success did come, like I knew I had such a clear vision of what I wanted the band to be, you know, like I really, you know, and Chris, I had Chris as my drummer, Chris Contos, and he had toured a lot in hardcore bands, attitude adjustment, verbal abuse. He was in Grinch. He was in, you know, many things that, you know, so he had been doing squat tours and shit like that. So he had had a lot rougher. So this was like, you know, a luxury and Adam and Logan, they had never even been in a band before. So like they had never even played a show prior to being in machine head. So this, every, everything for them was brand fucking new. And so, you know, and they kind of had, you know, you know, certainly because I had done so many tours already, like in vans, like I was over it. Like I just wanted to, I was like, I can't do, you know, so right away we start touring in a bus and, you know, so their, their first tours in a bus, they've got, you know, we're sharing a backline guy and, you know, whereas my first tours was like in a van for two months, like you're loading your gear, like you're tuning your strings, you get up on stage, play, and then you grab your amp and your fucking cabinet in one hand and carry it out to the fucking van and load it in there, you know, shit like that every night. So, um, you know, but I, I remember like when we got the, we we're on the obituary tour and all three bands were up for the Slayer tour and, and then they picked us which, you know, was a smart move on their part. We had a, a record that came in in like top 20 in the UK and it was, I mean, it fucking absolutely made sense. You know, we were hot band all over the video and shit, Headbangers Ball. And we were fucking, at, I mean, Slayer was like, I had seen Slayer more times than any other band up and down. Like I used to follow Slayer to LA, to Sacramento, to Fresno, like fucking, I loved Slayer. So it was a dream come true. Now, the other two bands on the tour were super pissed at us <laughs> that we got the tour. But, you know, it made the last couple of weeks of the tour a little awkward. But but uh, when we went over there and started doing that, then it was just like, whoa. I mean, it was fucking, you know, big shows, packed as fuck. And I just remember the first, we, the first night we played was in uh, Dublin, Ireland. And we opened with the video and it was the first time we, the crowd ever sang let freedom ring with a oh, shotgun man. blast back to us. That must've been nuts. It was the first time ever, like the whole U S tour. Nobody even knew who we were. And we were like, Whoa, like that's what people are going to do to this. Holy shit. I mean, it was, we, so we only had two shirts you know, we're main sport to Slayer. They only gave us two shirts. <laughs> and fucking, we outsold Slayer in merchandise that night. So their fucking tour manager's super fucking pissed. Like, what the fuck? And we're just like, what, what, what do we, you know, <laughs> it's the fucking crowd buying it. Like, we don't have anything to do with this. And, uh, and I just remember, you know, like, as, as in awe as I was of being on tour with Slayer, and I was genuinely in awe. Like my goal was to go up there and fucking blow them off the stage. You know, that's, that's all I wanted to do. Like, and, and I didn't mean it like, because I wanted to fucking fuck Slayer up or whatever, but I just, that's, that was my mentality. Like, I just want the only band for people to remember to be Slayer. So, you know, I felt like as we got bigger and then, you know, the accolades that came later down, I kind of felt like we, you know, we really, you know, we talked about our stage show and like, we got to be super, you know, we got to just go fucking crazy on stage and be jumping. And like, you know, we've got to fucking whip the crowds into a frenzy. Not, not to mention that when you're opening for Slayer in the nineties, you know, like fucking, this is like the classic time of when like people, you got slayered off the stage, you know, yeah. to me, it was like, this is life or death. Like we could get slayered. We're, you know, there's a fucking really good chance. We're going to get slayered off the stage. You know, it's, it's inevitable. And so like, we've got to go out there and fucking kill kill every night and you know i think when you're kind of put you know i mean we ended up doing that european tour and then they asked us to do uh the u.s tour so then it was slayer biohazard machine head and i love we loved biohazard we were totally wannabe biohazard <laughs> like we fucking loved biohazard we loved the guys they were like super cool dudes and we became good friends with them and uh you know i remember chicago at the Aragon ballroom and walking out on stage 
to the entire front row flipping us off. Slayer, fucking Slayer. I mean, like, just that's what you walked out to, to like, you know, a thousand people or whatever, you know, 2,000 people, whatever it was, just fuck you. I only want to see Slayer. And it was just like, all right, let's do this. You know, like fucking, you know, it was a trial by fire. And like, you fuck it, there was like, it was sink or swim. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to sink. Like I'm going to fucking swim. And in some ways it was amazing because you could sometimes take that fucking super angry energy that fuck you. And if you just turned it around a little bit, you could fucking make it work for you, you know, because they were just ready to go fucking crazy anyway. And so that's what, that's what we did, you know? And, we toured like fucking hell. I mean, we toured for 16 months on that first record and it was, and it was pretty, pretty amazing. We ended up doing Dynamo. It was, it was, a, it was pretty rad, rad time. What about this four out of 10 though, Rob? What would you have done differently in terms of how you dealt with the, you know, the attention and the success? I felt like I didn't, um, you know, I still wasn't good at communicating. And, you know, like I got to a point where like the fame, it was so big and so much and so fast. And I just didn't, uh, you know, like a lot of times I remember like fans coming up and like, you know, you'd open your front door, like you'd open the door of the bus and there'd be 50 kids waiting outside the bus to like get autographs. And this is, thank God this is before selfies, but you know, they want autographs and they want, you know, the pictures where you fucking go and wind, you know, shit like that. And I'd just be like, dude, like, fuck, you know, like I just, I'd get really agitated, you know, when I, when I should have just said the truth, Hey man, I just woke up. I just want to go take a shit inside the venue yeah. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll come in, grab a coffee, like eat something. And then I'll come back out and like, you know, do this with you. Instead, my reaction would be like, fuck, like, like uh, fucking, you know, like, and I'd just kind of storm past him and then it'd be like, Oh, you're a fucking rock star. You're a dick. And, you know, and I, I could have handled that better. I felt like I could have handled that a lot better. You know, like I, I look back on that and I go, yeah, like, cause that's what I do now. And, and nobody, like everybody understands now, like, Hey dude, I got to take a shit. Like, yeah, just just, yeah. like, let me just get some coffee. Like, just be honest. Like that's all I needed to do. And I felt like there was, I had to be this person. I had to be this rock star or whatever, you know, like I uh, fucking, you know, rather than just say, you know, I got to take a shit. <laughs> yeah. you know because that's that real I, man. When you I would my, that i would probably feel that i would appear weak if i said something like that that was my mentality that i was weak if i said something and i didn't want people to think i was weak which now i listen to and i say out loud and the stupidest fucking shit i've ever fucking thought but at the time that's what i thought yeah no i get it man i get it you're trying to put off a persona and also, you know, you're young. That's that's a young brain mentality. It's like now you're older and you don't give a shit anymore, so you just say how you feel. I do the same thing, man. I'll get off that bus and if there are people there, and I'm like, th that first first thing in the morning shit when you're on a tour bus, that's real. You got it. Oh, man. It is, because it's like and nobody, nobody, put, nobody there puts it together. They're like, you're basically some stranger waiting outside of my bedroom that I just fucking walked out of. It's like <laughs> it's like if you, you, the listener right now, fucking opened your fucking door and there was 50 people outside of your bedroom door, like strangers, like, hey, dude, you know, like, just wait, what? What do you No, I just want to take a shit and get some coffee. <laughs> That's real. I can relate to that one right, for sure. Oh, you must man. have had some pretty cool moments with fans uh, over the years, though, in terms of like, you know, and Jesse, you as well, I'm sure um, people coming up and saying like how much what you've done and, and written and, and put out has affected them in a positive way. Those conversations must, you know, make up for the <laughs> the blanks when you need to run and get a shit. Has there been a lot of meaningful moments like that for the Perry with fans where it's, you know, it kind of been pretty intense? Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, um, a lot of my interactions pretty intense. I think just because the way I put myself out there on social media now and the lyrics that I write, it's a lot of heavy stuff, um, and I got to prepare myself for it. You know, like there are moments where I'll before I get out of the bus, I always check to see if they're out there, and then I sort of like have to sit and be like, all right, this is how I'm going to handle it because every morning's different. You know, I've, I've got issues, mental issues, and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, 
long story short, yeah, I appreciate the hell out of it. And a lot of times that shit keeps me going when I'm out there and I'm exhausted and, and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? Like, I want to be home. Like all those things inevitably fill my head at some point on a long fucking tour. And sometimes those fans and their stories that they share about their life and surviving suicide, abuse, you name it, run down the line, like that shit keeps me going. And it's it gives me a sense of purpose outside of just being in a band and doing a thing. There's a real human connection there that it's why I still do it. It's why I still give a shit is because of the fans and that connection and the stories they share with me. That shit is everything for me now. Yeah, I mean, I... I want to say like probably a, a little bit later on in, in my career is when I started getting more, more of that, you know, like around the burning red is when I, you know, I really opened, I went through therapy after the second album and I really like really peeled the onion, you know, like I just fucking kind of stripped myself down to just like a little kid again. And then had to rebuild myself back up into a man, and uh, and it was it was weird it was weird you know because you're doing it you're doing it in the public eye you know and and not that I'm not used to the public eye I've, I've been in the public eye since I was 19 you know so I, I and never not not been in the public eye so I'm I'm used to the the slings and arrows that come with it but you know the burning red was such a transformational time in my life you know like really figuring out you know like dealing with all those childhood traumas and dealing with you know just a, a myriad you know all this abandonment and issue from being adopted and and I sang about it and I sang about you know I had attempted suicide when I was 18 and and I sang about all of this on that record and and that record was really the one where where people would come up and you know, like, is it true? Like, is what you're singing about true on the record? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, fuck. Like, that's the same thing that happened to me. And then they'd tell me their story. And, you know, there's times when you're like, listen to this fucking, and, you know, fucking horrible. You know, like, it's like you're both crying, like listening to this dude, you know, or a girl tell you their story about, you know, abuse that they had been through or, their own things and yeah i mean it never it never doesn't you know it's almost like you know i don't want to say it got to a point where i needed to turn it off but it was just so it was overwhelming at times you know like it it like i wasn't prepared for even how to 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 deal with what people would say at times you know, like I didn't know how to react. Like, what what am I supposed to do? Like, am I supposed to hug you? Like, am I supposed to? You know what I mean? Like, I even kind of went through that because sometimes it was just like, you know, twenty or thirty stories a day. And uh, well, you guys aren't trained for that stuff, are you? You know, you're you're not trained to deal with that situation. You've just been put in it. Um, you know, consciously you put yourself there, but as you say, sometimes it can get a bit too much, and you do need to to protect yourself. Just kind of step back for a minute. Yeah, but it but it did help too. You know, it helped me because I was terrified to put these songs out. You know, like the songs on the Burning Red, certainly the last two songs, five and the song The Burning Red. Mm. I I was terrified. I went I can't even tell you how many times I kicked the Burning Red off of that album. <laughs> the last song on the record because I was like I don't I think like everybody's going to I'd go from this song sucks to everybody's going to think I'm a pussy to, you know, like just this whole fucking myriad of, of, of thoughts and emotions. And finally I just, you know, I was like, you know what, this is, this is a fucking really good song and the world needs really good songs. And, you know, I'm just going to roll the dice and I hope people love it. You know, that's all you can hope for. Like you never know what people are going to like when you put out a record, like times change and this change, you know, you change, people change. And, uh, and it, and I'm glad I did, you know, like that, that made it all worth it. And hearing people say that made me feel, uh, you know, less insecure about my choice to, to take it off or put it on or leave it on. You know what I mean? So like that meant a lot. 
It always it always means a lot. You know? Totally. Yeah, it's heavy stuff, man. But you know, I feel that with myself as well. When you just allow yourself to do that, the power that that has. You know, you you talk about the difference between a casual fan to somebody who's like hanging on to your words and like, what's the next record? I'll buy it. You know, I've got those fans, one hundred percent know you do, where they'll follow you anywhere, and that's it. Like you've become that person that allowed them to feel like they weren't alone in this world, and that never goes away. And that that's powerful shit. And I got to tell you, that record that was the one for me. That was the one for me. Yeah. I fucking love that record. So thank you for doing that because yeah. it changed my life. <laughs> Straight up. You know, it was the trippiest thing about that whole uh, experience too. You know, I was talking about how, you know, I kind of had, I had this, you know, I had this, I genuinely had this vibe about me, you know, in, in that early era of Machine Head. And, you know, some of it was a front. You know, some of it was real, but some of it was a front. But it's like I felt that I had to have that in order to, for people to like me, mm-hmm. for people to like Machine Head. And with the Burning Red and, you know, subsequent records after that, it really was eye opening to realize that the more you show of your true self, the more you peel away all of these fronts and these masks that you put on and this armor that you wear to the world, the more that you tear that all off and just expose yourself naked to the world is when people really, really fucking connect. And when people really, that's when, you know, you get motherfuckers that, you know, for life and, and and that was a that was a weird i don't know i don't know why that was so weird to me but i just remember realizing that somewhere around then like holy shit like i thought everybody was going to think i was a pussy <laughs> now <laughs> and fucking i you know people are more connected than ever and you know i i i try really hard to remember that you know i you know not that i have to constantly remind myself of that but i remind myself of that even now, even t- days like today or, you know, that, you know, I, I think people can see your soul. Like when you're up on stage, I, I genuinely, I know I've seen people who I felt like were kind of phony on stage. And then at some point they turned into something else. And I went, wow, like that's that dude's soul. And I like, I, that's, that's, that dude's really showing it his true fucking being right now. And I, and I believe people can see that man. And I, and I, and I think that that's as hard as it is to strip all that away and, and show those vulnerabilities and show that sensitivity or, or whatever. That's what, that's what life is, man. You know, that's what life is. And it's the power of music when you are able to expose yourself through that way. And that was the game changer for me was realizing that as well in my own career. And it's funny you say that too, because I'll see some, you know, younger bands come on the scene and they've just, they're filled with piss and vinegar. And I kind of just chuckle and like, just wait, <laughs> you'll grow out of that and you'll start to be genuine. And when you see that transition with certain bands, that's, yeah, that's awesome to watch. Right? It is. It's awesome to watch. It's amazing to watch. Yeah. It's such a, I don't know. To me, it's like, it's like one of the best things about being a music fan. You know, like when you see that moment happen and you're like, Oh fuck, like they tapped into it. Like that's fucking rad. Yeah. It's powerful shit, man. Speaking of not every every band does. (laughs) No, no, it's true. Some people are still fronting. (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot of motherfuckers front. I ain't naming names. Uh, But speaking of uh, vulnerability and honesty, I have to, commend you on your your stances you've taken uh, against racism especially in our metal community because i think that the times that you've stood up for it you know against it rather um you've taken some shit and i genuinely admire you for for doing that i mean 
and it's funny too because you would think that it's just a basic thing that people would do you know like to stand up against somebody who's being a piece of shit or an incident that happened and you know you you and i were able to collaborate on the song and like i back that that energy that force is something that i've always looked at you and like that's fucking awesome like i totally back that and it also speaks volumes to the amount of people who are willing to turn the other cheek or or sort of ignore it especially in our metal scene and that's that was eye-opening for me. Can you speak on that? How did that affect you when you got backlash, for example, for speaking out of, like when Phil Ansama was going through his white wine, white power thing through to, you know, um, George Floyd and the, and the song we made. Did that affect you in a very deep way when you realized how many people were giving you a kickback for that? Whew. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to go, I gotta, I gotta be careful with what I say here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to talk about anything specifically, but just your general thoughts and feelings, because it's something that I really thought about a lot before this talk and something that I really admire about you. I just thought it would be good to bring up, but you don't have to go where you don't want to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, my, my concern is this, this is like the type of shit that always gets picked up by the aggregators, which is, you know, the news aggregators. And I'm like, dude, come on. Yeah, and they pick out the one line of this amazing conversation we're having. Then they'll be, yeah, yeah exactly. you're right. So I guess we'll tread lightly on that. Maybe I can just say I admire you for that. How about that? I fucking admire right. you. For Thank you. For Thank speaking you, out against that. that. And I, um, I really, I really do appreciate you saying that. And you know, there was more than a handful of other artists. You know, good fifty to seventy artists who reach out to me after I did that personally you know via text and email yeah and we're like finally mm. thank you for fucking saying something you know like that motherfucker has been doing this for 20 fucking years thank you for finally fucking saying something mm. yeah it's crazy to me how the backlash from that and i guess we'll flip it into a more positive safe zone um to the song that we did together which i'm fucking so honored you asked me to do that and I guess piggybacking on what we were just talking about, the power of music and the power and the impact that that song had on me. And I know it had on a lot of fans too, as well. Um, which for everybody listening, if they're not familiar, it's Stop the Bleeding, right? Which is the yes. mach machine head track with you on guest vocals. Yeah. 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 Oh, and I guess what blows my mind about Killing that. Killing it on guest vocals too. By the oh, way. thanks, man. Killing it. That, that, that legitimately brought me life in a very odd time and like, it almost reminded me of who I was because I was starting to lose myself during this pandemic. <laughs> that was that was huge for me. So yeah, thanks for that. But um, yeah, it's crazy, man, because I've written about racism before. It's something that I, I try to on almost every record talk about. And it's amazing to me that people give you shit for it. And it's like, wh why the fuck are you my fan then? Do you not read the lyrics? Do you not know who I'm about? How does that even fucking happen? And I it has still happens to me on a regular basis like what lyrics are you reading who are you following are you really a fan of mine it's that's, it's that's wild mine, right? like what you know what 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 do you think we've been you know who do you think was telling a thousand lies <laughs> you know like, you know what i mean like fucking yeah well there, there was that person recently who was having to go at tom morello on twitter going rage against the machine just should stay out of politics and it's that famous tweet that went really viral it's like well what yeah. What machine do you think they were raging against this whole time? <laughs> the washing machine? Yeah. <laughs> the fucking but there are those those people out there that okay. believe that politics and you know they'll include racial issues within that political, you know, cut category. They believe that these things shouldn't exist in music, and that's just insane to me. As a fan of music, and not I'm not talking to somebody who makes it, I'm talking as a fan, like I want the bands that I love to talk about this stuff as it's happening. Otherwise, why are you a band? Right? You know, metal metal's in this weird place where we're totally okay to sing about wars and battles and, you know, things that happened 200 to 1,000 years ago. <laughs> I mean, there's some bands out there that literally like their entire catalog is just writing about other wars that happened for, you know, often 
very racially motivated wars. Other times it was just like, you know, for land or territory, you know, like wrong or right. Who fucking knows? Like, but like we're totally okay to hear a song about war. But like if we write about the wars that are going on right now, 2021, 2020, motherfuckers lose their minds. Like they lose their fucking minds. And it's like, I don't get it. You know, like I don't fucking get it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, maybe it's always been there and, you know, it certainly has always, you know, like I remember going to see Slayer shows and there was all kinds of fucking Nazi assholes. There's certainly fucking when we did the touring with them, there was plenty of fucking Nazi assholes in the fucking crowd, you know? And so that element's, you know, even like certainly in the hardcore scene here in the Bay Area, and I'm sure in New York, there was fucking Nazi skins and fucking all kinds of different skins that were racist. You know, you fucking wear a certain, you know, your boot had a certain fucking color <laughs> shoestring in it. And like, it meant this and that. And, you know, I mean, it's like that shit's been around for a while. But, uh, you know, and granted, you know, like I know, I, you know, metal is to me, it's like the dark side of life. And, you know, obviously Slayer sang about Joseph Mengele and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, I think that, and and that's why I was attracted to it. You know, that's why I am attracted to it because it is about the dark side of life. It's about horror. It's about violence. It's about, you know, you know, serial killers and just like all of the ugly shit in life. And, you know, I can't say that I wasn't enamored by that. You know, that's why I like, that is a big part of why I like metal. You know, there's a darkness in me that draws me to that darkness when I see it in another band, you know, and there's nothing that makes me feel like metal does, you know, like, like I said, I saw Slayer a million times. They'd get to that fucking part in war ensemble. Whoa. I'm fucking, I still get, I got goosebumps just now just thinking about it. You know, like it fucking does that to me every fucking time, you know, and it probably will for the rest of my fucking life because that band has been so special to me. But, you know, there, there is that element and, you know, I think that, you know, look, no one wants to face the blowback. That's what it's all about. No one wants to deal with the blood. If you're out there promoting your brand new record, the last thing you want is some fucking controversy about some fucking racist asshole. <laughs> you know, are you calling out some racist asshole? And, uh, you know, so when most band dudes are doing press, which is when they're promoting a new record, that's when, you know, they're going to turn the other cheek and not say anything. And, and I, I'm guilty of that too. <laughs> you just made a video in your hotel room though, right? And like anybody could have done that at any point. Um, and interestingly, that video, I don't know, you probably aren't watching it regularly, of course, but I went to watch it earlier today and it's had nearly 2 million views, Rob. Wow. And, you know, you just went in your room, put your laptop on and said, these are my thoughts on this issue because I feel like I have to speak up. Any, any other number of people could have done that. Well, uh, because I was there, you know. Well, yeah. But there were definitely other people there who could. I, I had to stand on that stage, you know, yeah. with the dude while he was doing it. You know, I wasn't giving. This wasn't me just, you know, commenting on some shit I saw on Instagram. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I had to fucking be there, and you know, that was just my. Yeah, you know, I don't regret it. I regret, I regret what it did to my family. Mm. Why? Because of mad things like death threats and bullshit like that. Fucking th I mean, a thousand death threats, you know, and fucking crazy stalkers and, you know, like my kids being scared and my wife being scared for fucking years, you know, like it lasted for years. Wow. It was, it was bad, you know, that's we insane. Had, we had to get security. Like it was fucking ugly. It was fucking ugly, you know, people putting our fucking address out, you know, people doxing us. Like it was fucking really, really scary. And, you know, my wife really had a hard time dealing with it. My kids, you know, they were young enough that they didn't really understand everything was that was going on. You know, they understood it 
to a point. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a very difficult time and it really showed an ugly side of the world, you know, and it also showed a beautiful side of the world. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of people that came out and were like, Hey, fuck you, you know, and to all those people, to those ugly people. That's what I meant when I said that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and it still kind of goes on, you know, even to this day, you know, amazingly, it's been five years <laughs> now, <laughs> since five and a half years since that video went up and, you know, I'll still get, you know, I'll still get death threats and, you know, most of them are kind of just funny now. Like I just kind of laugh at them now because they're just so fucking stupid. And I'm just like, all right. Yeah. But, but there was definitely an extended period where those threats seem very real, very scary. And as you say, when you have a family, when you've got wife and kids. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know it was that intense, man. That sucks. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Honestly, um, I almost feel like we should just move off the subject now. <laughs> um, right. I would love to to shift over to your podcast. Okay. Because uh, I fucking love it. The vibe you put out there. It's very relaxed. It's funny. How, how did that start? And what made you decide, like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do? Because you're very open with it. And even how you are on social media, you're just... Oh, I'm a fan of it. I, I love the openness and the and the casualness and the funniness. Where did that all start? I mean, I think, I mean, you're probably the same. You know, talking to you guys is this isn't like an interview. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you and I are so used to doing an interview that, you know, like, I was like, what do I want my podcast? Not an interview. Yeah, <laughs> like, totally, <laughs> totally. I'm so like, you know, not that you know. That every once in a while, you know, there's certainly great journalists out there, and like doing a great interview you know matt i said this to you when you were on my thought you know fucking great interview like when i see matt stock is on the fucking docket for the day i'm like oh fuck yeah like i know this is going to be killer because the dude's fucking awesome and he knows his shit and he's fucking learned and he you know is smart and funny and can like you know pick up on something and carry it someplace and and uh thank you and that makes and that makes a great interview like it make because it's not an interview it's a conversation and, and that's, you know, all I was hoping to do with it was just like, here, I'll talk to some people. I'll ask him shit that like, I want to know. And, you know, I, I, the whole premise of it was that it was going to be, you know, kind of more sex, drugs and rock and roll. Like I wanted to have, you know, fun, crazy stories and not, I don't necessarily, I don't not care about your new record, but I don't care about it that much that I want to just have, do a whole interview about it. And, uh, you know, I'm more interested in your life and moment you know the things that you know part of it be called no fucking regrets is that everybody that i have on in my opinion is someone who came to a, a place in their road in their life and they could have gone into normal nine to five life or they could have gone to something with no safety net such as being in a band or being a fucking MMA guy or being a baseball man. Well, you know, I've had Tony La Russa on from, you know, baseball manager. I've had MMA guys. I've had a lot of band guys. And why did you do that? Why did you go that way instead of into something that might've been safe and, you know, a backup plan, you know, here you went with no backup plan, which is very much what I did. You know, that's what I did in my life. I had, like, I was going to be in a band. That was it. Like, you know, like once I went down that path, that was it. I had no backup plan. There was no plan B. I wasn't going to go to college if shit didn't work out. Like I was going to be in a band and, and I was going to make it work. And, and so that became a big part of it. And then, you know, like I felt like I was pretty good. Like, you know, I, I think early on, I kind of focused a lot on the sex, drugs, and rock and roll aspect of it because I was just like, let's, like, that's, that's the shit that people want to fucking, you know, who doesn't want to know how many times, you know, fucking Lars Fredrickson from Rancid jerks off in a day. Lars is a dream guest of mine. I fucking he's love Rancid. He's, the, he's one of the fucking, he was my first podcast. He was, was fucking, he? he was the greatest guest I could have, started. I mean, spoiled, spoiled me after that, you know, like Amazing. he's such a funny guy, super charismatic, amazing stories for days. 
And uh, anyway, so. I, I remember, Rob, when we did our podcast, when you were on my show, Life in the Stocks, and you were saying to me that you you know, consume them at such a rate that it's almost taken over your interest in music. So obviously when you do start your own, you, as everybody does, you find your feet and what the vibe of the show is, the more episodes you do. But right. you'd obviously been listening to podcasts for so long, you knew what a good show kind of required. And so, um, you know, you kind of had that, I think, going into it as an advantage. And then you just find your feet as you go, right? And you kind of expand on the original concept the more episodes you do and i listened to the melissa cross episode that you did because we recently had her on oh cool that was a beautiful conversation i mean she's just amazing but what was great about that is both of you got really deep and intimate and vulnerable and you know both of you shared stories that revealed so much about yourselves not just her as the guest but you you know too as the host yeah i mean i felt like early on my you know, I was kind of limited by if a band was coming through town, you know, I'd have to go and carry all my fucking podcast shit and, you know, got to set up there and welcome you know. to my life, mate. Yeah, I know it. I know it. <laughs> and then you get like 30 minutes with the band and there's like some jackass sound checking behind you and it's loud and you're like, fuck, you know, like I, you know, you could get a good vibe, but it was just, it's always like, and you know, that's what you've been dealing with and everybody's been dealing with. I, I feel like the podcast came into its own, uh, during the pandemic, you know, I think that, that, you know, first of all, everybody was off the road. <laughs> everybody was bored out of their fucking minds. I was like, Hey, want to jump my podcast? Like, yeah, fuck yeah. And, uh, and, and somewhere in there, I just kind of found, you know, I kind of feel like I felt like what you were saying, like you kind of find your feet and like how you want it, what you're trying to get across. And, and you know, it, it did become more like conversational it became more about the person's life and, and, you know, just trying to find those nuggets of humanity that, you know, may, that makes us all connected, you know, and that's, that's a big part of what it was for me. You know, like I, I think even just making music a big part of what it is for me is feeling a connection with people, you know, feeling that fucking connection of, music and you know i'm the same way when i'm a fan in the audience too like i want to feel that connection with the band and you know the podcast is just an extension of you know i've done general journals before like where you know i write down these things but i just found that like the podcast and then and then you know zoom which nobody even fucking heard about zoom prior to the fucking pandemic like i was like what's zoom like now everybody like that's zoom is our life and you know like that that changed it too like being able to look at somebody like some of them i had to do like over the phone and like there's always like drop out you know like getting that going and being able to look at somebody and then talk to them and then being able to put the video up which really like you know all of my early podcasts had no video attached to them so there was just just the audio with a picture of the person and and you know i really feel like that totally changed the game and like even changed the whole dynamic of what my podcast is you know i know people listen to it for sure and i got great i got i see the numbers they're great but you know the video aspect of it is really you know now we put it up there's like the live chat that goes on we premiere it so that everybody can talk like while it's premiering and then you know then they leave comments and it's like it's fucking cool man like it really opened it up in a way that i you know i i didn't know if i'd I didn't know if I'd like podcasting as much as I do. You know, I didn't, I didn't think I'd not like it, but I, I didn't, uh, you know, just being able to talk with other musicians during this crazy time, you know, it helped keep me sane, Mm -hmm. you know, like dudes that you might've normally run into on a festival circuit that you just can't or, and, but even more than that, like, like when I had Jesse on, I never could have had that conversation with Jesse just sitting at a fucking backstage dressing room, you know, like we would have been like, Hey, Hey, cool. You know, we might've talked for five or 10 minutes and then we might've had to go off and do our own things, you know? And instead we had an hour and a half conversation that was super deep and heavy and awesome and, you know, fucking cool. You know, that type of shit made me feel more connected to my musical peers and, you know, peers and others aspects than than if we would have seen each other at a show or 
played on a festival or even, you know, maybe if we toured together, it might be something else. Cause when you're on tour, you can establish a deeper relationship because you see each other every day. But you know, that part of it really made me feel very connected. You know, I was talking to Brian from corn, Brian head Welch. And we, we were both bitching about how the fucking crew always takes over, <laughs> you know, like, like the fucking crew drama always consumes like somehow like the crew always tries to draw the band into the drama and i was just like oh my he was going on i was i was going on i was like oh my god like you know like i don't know if we would have had that conversation on the road somewhere just been like fucking the fucking crew <laughs> like, why is that why are the crews always crazier than the band <laughs> right it's you so know true. like it's then they fucking they start hating somebody and then like you're supposed to i'm like motherfucker like you work for me like i'm not gonna i don't want to hate this person I'm paying your salary. Like, just deal with it. That's so funny. That's so true. We, yeah, we've had to like, God. yeah, we've had to deal with some some crew issues too. <laughs> so, like, and then they start thinking like they're in charge. Like, oh, I'm gonna make the decision. But and I'm just like, you you ain't making any decision. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, the crew we got now, but we've we've had some loose cannons. But yeah, that's. Yeah. Funny. it's so true i've never heard that but yeah it's definitely like, oh my god we we bitched for like 15 minutes about the crew and i fucking swear to god it was like so goddamn cathartic <laughs> to hear somebody else fucking complain about it oh it was the best hysterical <laughs> yeah i mean i agree with you i, I think um yeah, i was doing podcasts before we started our podcast but I didn't think I'd like it as much as I do either. I, I, tr I can see myself doing this for a long time and I feel like it just, it's open. There's no limitations. You know, Matt and I set out from the gate with an open idea. Like there's really, we're not trying to define it to be this specific thing. It just became this great conversation we have with people and it sustains me. You know, if we don't do it for a few weeks, say if we get a couple episodes in the can and Matt and I don't talk for a little while, like, him and I are like lost. We're like, dude, podcast keeps us like in line, dude. And having these conversations and hearing people's stories, it's become an important part of my life. I never thought that would be the case. And it's, it's great. It's great that I've discovered that part of me that likes this and has this conversation. And you're right. You can have that conversation with people you would never have in real life out there with artists, whatever. It doesn't matter who you are, comedian, you're in passing. It's just, you're never going to have the depth that you get with this. And it's incredible. And I love, I love what you do, Rob. I love the podcast. It's great. I think, uh, I love that you guys have like your, your fans, like your podcast fans are like a guest on there every once in a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we bring the guests in. Yep. Those are heavy. Yeah. It's cool. They yeah. are. They're some of the most really like awe inspiring, profound interviews out of all of them um people right. have just been through totally. and that was always my initial thinking was you can get on the most famous guest in the world but you know they'll be just a regular guy from the street or have a story just as crazy as that person um, yeah and, the, and sometimes the big guests are the worst because yeah they don't want to talk about drama they don't you know it's like this very kind of mm -hmm. it's just all the right answers you know and you're just like <sighs> yeah so, protecting like, their reputation or whatever totally Totally. And like you get somebody who is just a fan and like they're going through their life and like their life is oftentimes 10 times more interesting because it's, you know, they may not have the financial means, you know, or the whatever, you know, yeah. so it's, it's fucking, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that a lot, but I have done it sometimes and I, I twitch also. So I've got like all those, I've had my sub, like the twitch people were on, I had them all on. But it was more just like, the, it was just the crazy ones that were on. So that was even more fun because it was like, you didn't really hear about somebody's, you know, hard thing. It was just like the fucking, you know, they were just trying to out wild each other and <laughs> say the craziest thing or do they just talk about the craziest subject. And, oh my God, it was, it was fucking, you know, we found out who, you know, one guy's got like a huge selection of dildos right next to his bed that they keep in a drawer, you know, like they have just, you know, like all this shit that, you know, you probably couldn't even get like a big guest to talk about, right? Like, like 
you know, maybe you could maybe you could finesse it out of them, but like these people are just like, yeah, fuck yeah, we got this and we got that, and then we got a whole. And then my one friend's got like a he's got like just a batch for just like throwing at his friends when they're drunk, like big the super giant ones. And I was like, that's amazing. You know, so like hearing those kind of stories, dude, fucking, I mean, just it's amazing. That's the shit that like keeps me going. Like it's so fucking awesome to hear, and and it's great to hear people open up and they want to open up. They, that's the thing that's cool about it. You know, like they're, they want to talk about it. They're happy to talk about it. So them, it's funny. Yeah. I, I think the key thing's community, isn't it as well? Like you guys have both been in bands for years and you have your fan base and that's so special, but there's something very different about this format and the relationships that you build. I mean, have you noticed that Rob, like obviously you've been in this game for so long now, have you noticed the, the audience you have just from your podcast is perhaps different to, you know, a machine head fan say. I it, it's hard to tell for me. I don't. I'm not sure. Like I don't. I can't really tell. You know. I I think that they're. I think that they're all. Pretty much machine head fan. And I mean, I that certainly like because it's my, my podcast is a little, more. You know, I've. I mean, I certainly have people who just listen to my intro. And then they don't even care who the guest is. They just really? like, all they want to do is listen to the intro. They're like, it's the best part. Intro Alice Cooper's on this week. Don't care. <laughs> They're like, don't care. Like, I just want to, you know, and I do, I do just do, sometimes I just do like, I call it a Rob rambling. So it's just me talking for 45 minutes about what fucking ever. And, uh, I could never do those, man. You hold court really well with them. I've heard you do a few of those, and I I try and get my intros when I'm doing my show on my own. I try and get the intros done and over with because I hate just talking to a mic by myself I, i'm no good at that at all but you you have a really good command of like pacing and you can just deliver great speeches on the spot it seems mm -hmm. like thank you thank you i don't yeah i mean some so sometimes i do those but i do feel like my you know i don't think i i don't know if i could make a podcast living off of that i feel like it's my podcast is a little guest dependent you know maybe more than i'd like but it is and uh, so, you know, so when you put out a, a guest, you know, you, you do get some of their fan base, you know, who might not even fucking have heard Machine Head, you know, like I just had Will Ramos from Lauren Ashore, you know, super brutal deathcore band. I, may, I fucking love them. And he was the fucking coolest motherfucker. Like we hit it off like a house on fire and he was cool as shit. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that most of his fan base would listen to Machine Head. You know, maybe, maybe now they are. So like, but I know that they all love the interview. And so now maybe they'll just follow that or maybe they'll go into machine head or maybe they won't. I don't know. Yeah. You never know. It's a cool dynamic though. I, I like that you did that, you know? Yeah. For us, like when we have a listener on like the rate, you know, the ratings and the numbers aren't great, but it's so fulfilling. So we try to balance that out with like bigger names to like get the numbers up and, you know, right. make this thing a long-term thing. But you know, if, if it were up to me, man, I would love to have more listeners on. So we're trying to, we try to s skirt that line, you know, cautiously, but, um, yeah, though, I love the, when you just, it's just you too. Yeah. You do have a gift for that. It's definitely entertaining and interesting to listen to you go off. Yeah, and I don't know how I did. Like, I just, I just start talking. <laughs> you know, I do, you know, I found like, I used to just kind of ramble. Now, at least I write down a couple of notes like, okay, I want to remember to talk about this subject or this subject, you know? So like, I just put like, like, what am I, I was going to do one today. I don't know if I'm going to do it cause we're coming up here for a while, but, uh, <laughs> like I wrote down Patrick Mahomes, Kansas city, uh, Cleveland game. Th th that's all I put. That's it's the extent that. of it, but that's that why they that. work because you can tell it's not scripted. It's off the cuff. It's yeah. just natural. Got, vaccine mandates, hanging with my stepsister and my dad this weekend. You know, Xander, who's my son, who went crazy playing with the kids. Drake selling 600,000 copies his first week compared to <laughs> Iron Maiden, 60,000. Wow. That's my, that's just my, uh, okay, here's a subject. And then I just go off that'll trigger enough of a memory to go, okay, this is what I'm going to say. Well, well, that, all that being said about, you know, guests and having a bigger guest on and not being, having be interesting this has been incredibly interesting and it's run longer than we usually do. And I love it. I think it's great. And I honestly can't thank you enough, not only just for coming on our show, but for being a friend of mine, it's really cool to have somebody that I admired for so long and still admire 
very much so. I admire you more now than I ever did, but to, to call you a friend and be able to just chat with you and hang out with you and see the, the human side of you. And you've allowed people to see the human side of you um, through your Instagram posts and your, um, your podcast. And I love it. So thank you for that, man. Truly appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you very much, man. No, like the same goes to both of you guys. I mean, both of you guys have been you know, awesome to me. Like I told you when you were on, Matt, you were fucking great. Jesse, I've been a fan of your music for you know, 20 plus years now. I mean, the first time I ever heard that fucking Kill Switch record, it fucking blew my mind. I mean, that's Supercharger Tour. That's the only record we listened to was the fucking first Kill Switch record. We were like, holy shit, your fucking voice was just so pissed i was like this motherfucker's got problems and i love it <laughs> you know it was just i want uh, just wanted to hear that you know and i still love hearing that like when you sing now like you're able to channel this you know like you're able to channel your your problems and your struggles and your traumas and your joy into you know singing and it's such a special gift man like it's such an incredible gift Oh, super honored by those words. That's awesome, man. I I don't know any other way. <laughs> that's it. And you're right. I, I definitely have issues. But, uh, you know, I think that's why we're doing what we do, right? That's it. Like, that's the way I deal with my demons and, and figure my shit out is through my music. I can't yeah. do it any other way. Absolutely. I'm honored by your words, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm very good at Instagramming as much anymore. I'm, you know, it's weird. I've kind of like pulled away my mom passed away about six months ago back in april sorry, and uh, i feel like i i feel like since then i don't know why but i just every time i go to post on instagram now like i kind of blank like i don't know what to do like i went the other day like i didn't post for like four days and i was just like you know i think you know i kind of you kind of get conditioned to like oh you gotta you gotta post every day and if your numbers might go down you know likes and i'm just like I don't, I don't, I don't know if I changed after that, but maybe, or maybe I looked at the world differently now. Mm. I don't, I, I, you know, or maybe I'm still like just kind of processing, you know, some of it with, you know, her passing away, but it was just like, you know, it was, it was such a, it was, you know, her, her death was horrific. You know, she had been, at 70, she decided to go all in on opioids. And uh, so for the last 10 years of her life, she was really like, I mean, she had always been on a lot of medication, but then it just became, I mean, fucking, <laughs> it was insane. And uh, I mean, she was on 12 different like hardcore medications, like antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds and this is and that's is and fucking steroids and, you know, full steroid flushes and, and, uh, and then, a, and then a whole cocktail of medications to fight the side effects of those medications. So it was just, it was a really rough 10 years. And, um, you know, she, she had a heart attack and, and, uh, and a stroke and bleeding of the brain all at one time. Oh my God. And so she, she passed out in her, in her place and she had two caregivers who would, come and she fired one of them but didn't tell anybody so like there was only they were only coming like half the time like every other day which nobody knew about because she had just fired this person for whatever reason and uh so the night that this happened is the night that she uh the person that was fired would have come but then because she fired him this she went so it was 24 hours just laying on the ground by you know immobile unable to move after having heart attack and and, uh, you know, so after that, they, she couldn't move and she had been having, you know, she's had a million health problems. She'd been in and out of the hospital, you know, can't, I can't even tell you how many times. And, uh, because, you know, in large part because of all the drugs and because of all these, this meds, you know, like she was a full on pharmaceutical drug addict. She wasn't a drug addict, like a heroin drug addict, like where her dealer was on the street and she was shooting up or smoking crack. She was her doctor had a stethoscope and a white lab coat. And, uh, you know, we, she finally was just, she, you know, she couldn't move. And the doctor pulled me aside and he's like, look, sir, he's like, I don't, I don't want to be brutal with you, but he's like, this is, this is it. Like, don't, there's no coming back from this. She's not going to walk again. She's not going to, 
you know, like this is it. So just, you need to start preparing yourself mentally. And he's like, I'm sorry to say, and I was like, don't be sorry. You know, like I'm, I'm fucking so glad that you're just like coming with the truth and, and telling me how, like, just tell me, tell it to me straight doc. <laughs> like that, I don't need any, you know, I don't need any fucking sugar coating here. And so I thank you for that. And, you know, we had to put her in a home and, you know, it's just this kind of long, slow, uh, you know, and I, and I had this fantasy, <clears throat> I've had this fantasy for years that once the end was near and we got her into a home that I'd be able to get her off the drugs that she would be the mom that I remembered growing up, you know, sober and not on this insane cocktail of pharmaceuticals. And I went and talked to the doctor about it and I said, Hey, like I want to, I want to start weaning her off all this shit. Like, let's get her, you know, I don't want her on any of this shit anymore. And he just broke it down. He's just like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. He's like, she's been on this stuff for so long that it'll kill her to take her off all of this. So she's going to be on this till the day she dies. And, you know, to just have this fantasy crumble you know, to have this, and I, and it, you know, granted it was probably a very unrealistic fantasy for me to even have, but it just kind of like broke this part of me. It just kind of crushed me for, and I, and I still kind of feel it to some degree, you know, cause I wanted, I don't know. I wanted my mom back and to just know that it wasn't ever going to be that was like, wow. And so, she finally, and you know, she, she held on for a while. She held on. Just fucking, she's a tough motherfucker. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like she didn't, you know, she was, she just refused to give in and, and, you know, she passed away and, and, uh, and you know, it's just kind of like, I don't know why, like, I don't know why me posting on social media, it affected that. But like, I don't know. I just didn't want to put myself out on social media I don't know why. Like, I still haven't figured it out. And like, I'm still, you know, but it's made me look at social media, like in a whole different way. And like fucking, you know, it's just such a, it's really toxic. And it, maybe that's just what I don't want. Like I've just kind of had to process all this toxic shit and I just don't want any more toxic shit <laughs> coming down my feet or if I, I've unfollowed a bunch of motherfuckers. I'm like, fuck all you guys. <laughs> like fucking, I'm sick of you. Like, I don't need your shit. And, uh, I don't know, but in some ways it's kind of got me a little more peace of mind. Like I know I need to be on there. Like, of course, but, I don't know, between the podcast and between talking to guys like you and, you know, it's just way more fulfilling to me. And, you know, like the people that are, you know, like motherfuckers who, you know, wake up and start fucking Instagram living <laughs> you know, and then, you know, have like 50 fucking stories and 20 posts and then another Instagram live at the end of the night. I'm like, you know, it must be nice to like have nine hours a day <laughs> to just post on fucking Instagram. Like I don't, I can't do that. And I, and I don't even want to do that, you know, but that's what the algorithm of Instagram rewards. You know what I mean? Like that person is getting the most fucking followers and getting the most highest in the algorithm. And it's like this weird culture where the most narcissistic fucked up person who says the most outrageous fucking stupid, unbelievable. What the fuck are you even talking about? Shit. <laughs> is fucking rewarded <laughs> you know like it's fucking it boggles my mind well it's not just confined to that platform either is it that's what's no, driving, no. that's what's driving it but it really is yeah. indicative of this you know cultural wide shift towards the innocuous and the insincere um and so to go through what you've just been through 
you know, you're seeking real, aren't you? You're seeking authenticity and really just realizing that actually here's what matters in life. And I think, you know, me and Jesse talk about this quite a lot on the show and just personally as well is like, this time has really taught me what's important and who's important. And I, I look at a lot of it as well, man, the industry and, you know, and online activity. And I just think I just, I'm over it. And you, you have to be in it to promote your shit and it's kind of a necessary evil, but it's certainly not where I want to be, you know, focusing my attention and energy right now after what you just talk about there going through personally, like on a global scale, I feel like we've been through lesser versions of that. Um, you know, far lesser in some cases, cause that sounds horrible, but do you know what I mean? It's like, it's a time now to just focus on the real, I think, and, and be conscious of the unreal. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Heavy. That's heavy yeah. stuff, man. Yeah. I, um, I can relate to the, the social media thing too, as well. It's like, there have been times where I'll go to go live or do something. Cause I'm like in my head, I'm like, I, you know, trying to keep maintaining and trying to figure out who I am outside of music. And yeah, there are moments where I'll just put my phone away. I'll fuck, I'll put that fucker on airplane mode and I'll be in the yes. moment. And, and, and when you're in the moment, those like, like being present in the moment has become my number one goal in life period. And to me, social media is work. When I got a post about a podcast or whatever, to me, it's like, I just do my work. I fucking put it up and then I, I let it go out there. I don't sit there and scroll and go, what did they say? What did they say? I used to, I used to give a fuck and I don't anymore. And it's changed me. Like I really love, like if we're going, my girl and I are, and I feel bad because she loves to capture moments for memories, but there's mm -hmm. a huge part of me. It's like, put the phone down. I don't give a fuck. Let's just be in it. The sun, the sunset is for us right now. Don't even fucking take a picture of it. Right. I'm trying to find that balance, but I feel that just, you want real. And when you go through something traumatic and that sounds uh, horrible. Yeah. You just, you don't want any more bullshit. You just, you, what's important. And social media is not fucking important. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I hate it too, but it's a necessary evil though. You know, when you're trying to make a living, carve out yourself as an artist, you, you need it. Unfortunately. Yeah. And, Feel you know, I, I find that balance and I, you know, I, I do post and then sometimes I post too much. I'm like, all right, like stop, you know, stop yeah. scrolling, stop, st <laughs> you know, stop looking at Instagram for fuck's sake. Jesus. It's, you know. it's addictive. It's that time. I'm trying, to, I'm trying you know what I'm, I'm and, I, and I'm writing a record right now. So I'm really trying to like, okay, you know, I, I've got that thing where you can like see how much time you wasted on yeah. your phone every day. And I look at it all the time. Cause I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Christ, I was like, which you realize only up the time. What the fuck is the matter with me? <laughs> two hours of my life, like I could have been writing a lyric, I could have been writing a riff. Like, what yeah. the fuck is the matter with me? Like, I'm, and now I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm searching for something to like help me get out of this. And so, I, last night I downloaded, I read books on my iPad at, when I go to bed because re, reading for like twenty minutes or thirty minutes like helps me fall asleep. Like, it totally just makes me fall asleep. Totally. And, uh, so I download it and I read on my iPad because I just sit there. It's got the little stand. I just kick it and I'm like, put my hand on my balls and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> just read, read and pose. Like, like reading. Sometimes my balls are cold. I'm like, I'll warm them up right now. And read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and so I do that and I downloaded this comedy, a stand up comedy. No, I have no idea why I downloaded a sample of this book, but I was just like, I'm just searching fucking, I'm browsing through the fucking iPad iBook store and I stumble across, I look, go on Seth Rogen because he's got a new book out and I download a sample of that and it was okay. I was like, I don't know if I could go this, you know, I could, but I just don't know if I want this right now. And then right under it was this how to do stand up comedy. And I was like, I mean, I could probably learn something from this, like that would be good for me in my life. So let's just get the sample because the sample's free. So I'm like, all right, we'll figure that you know, I download it. And, and, uh, it was actually real. I'm going to download the book. And I, of course I forget my fucking password. And then if you enter your password three oh, fucking God. times, I'll fucking shut out. I'm like motherfucker. So, but I read the whole sample and the sample's great. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. This will be the last thing that we will can close with this. It. Jerry Seinfeld it goes into a thing about Jerry Seinfeld. And, uh, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, one of the most widely respected, funniest fucking human beings on earth. But, you know, since the, the, you know, the high era of, of Seinfeld, which everybody knows and loves, he's still 
consistently done specials. He's constantly on the road touring. He's, you know, helping produce. He does like TV shows and he does the coffee with comedians and yeah. cars or whatever that is. Yep. He pr produces other comedians specials. And, you know, they're just like, this dude is just constantly, you know, putting out, you know, he just put out a huge special that was, you know, widely well received. And they're like, how are you still doing this all these years later? Like, why are you so fucking motivated? And like, this is crazy. Like you're out. The level of output that you have is insane. And he broke it down that and I'm totally going to do this. I'm totally stealing this from Jerry Seinfeld, but he is. He gets a calendar, big, like three foot calendar. And he goes and he sets a timer. And every single day, he writes uninterrupted jokes for 20 minutes every single day, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Like without fail, at some point, he sits down, sets his timer on his phone for 20 minutes, writes jokes. Even if the joke sucks, he just keeps on writing and doesn't stop until he's done. And then he goes onto the calendar and he marks the calendar full big and big red fucking, you know, big red. Okay, you did it. And he's like, you know, when you first look at the calendar, the calendar looks like shit because you've got like one or two marks. But then pretty soon you start to see a whole, you know, thing on your calendar. And he's like, and then you just take that and you start refining from there and you'll refine it. You know, but you just got to put in the work every little bit, every single day. He's like, just the 20 minutes. And so now I'm like, okay, 20 minutes of lyrics, 20 minutes of guitar, you know, at least, you know, trying to write on guitar, not just playing another song that I've, you know, or just jamming you know, Van Halen or whatever the fuck, <laughs> you know, but like trying to write a new song, trying to write an acoustic part, trying to write a heavy part, whatever. And then I'm going to get a big old fuck off calendar <laughs> and a big old fuck off red pen and start doing that shit. And I'm going to just sit down or, or and maybe just limit my Instagram to 20 minutes. Okay, what do you want to say on Instagram? You got 20 minutes. That's it. That's it. That's a great idea. You I know? like, I like that way I'm doing it consistently, but I'm not like consuming two hours of my fucking life on fucking Instagram. It's about so. discipline, isn't it? And sharpening your tools and keeping them sharp. And that's, you know, yeah, that right. work ethic is what. And that's what he says. He's like, it's a muscle. Yep. You got to keep on using it, man. That's facts. Yeah. yeah I, I am definitely not good with that shit. I could. I know. I, I'm I, fucking I, lazy. I, yeah. I could probably use a calendar, a big fucking calendar too. <laughs> well, we all know what's going in each other's stock into this Christmas. <laughs> big fucking calendar. <laughs> Rob, Guys, thank thanks you. for having me, man. Thank you, dude. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your kind, kind words yeah. about me. And, and just thank you for being you and doing what you do and, you know, putting out what you put out into the world, not just with the music, but with your voice. Um, you are a, a unique and special and uh, an important figure in the metal community. And I hope that you um, I hope you know that you're valued. Thank you, man. Yeah. What he said, you know, I fucking love you, brother. Thank you yeah. so much for coming on. And uh, I look forward to crossing paths with you and being in passing at some point. But we have a 10 minute quick conversation. It's probably not going to be 10 minutes, but just to see you again would be great, man. So much but, love. Yeah. To you. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. All hail, Steve. Take it easy, guys. 